So um, first I want to thank you, uh, everyone, for organizing this. In particular, I want to thank uh, Chloe and uh, Hamid for making sure that uh, everything went smoothly with me getting here. And, um, and so today I want to talk about um, data efficiency in autonomous robots and how to address data efficiency or the data efficiency challenge using probabilistic models. So if we talk about autonomous robots, we may want to think about uh, autonomous robots in the form of nano robots that can repair blood cells aut uh, autonomously or space exploration robots. <coughs> but normally what we often think about, the vision that we have is autonomous robots that support humans in everyday activities such as elderly care or walking the dog or uh, taking the trash out. But in order to implement this vision of autonomous robots, these uh, autonomous robots need to be able to learn very quickly and to also automatically adapt to new situations. The current state of the art, at a, let's say, roughly speaking, is that autonomous learning algorithms in this context are extremely data hungry uh, or require human guidance to get somewhere. So the challenge we need to address is that we want to design algorithms for fully autonomous learning and decision making with little data in real life situations. I will be using <coughs> uh, reinforcement learning as a principled mathematical framework for autonomous learning and decision making and that leaves us with learning from little data or learning with little data as one of the key problems that we are going to address. So the central problem I want to address today is data efficient reinforcement learning and broadly speaking we, we can define data efficient reinforcement learning as the ability to learn and make decisions in complex domains but without requiring large quantities of data and that is what I want to be focusing on today. <coughs> um, so in my talk I'm going to go through three pillars or three possible pillars of data efficient reinforcement learning. First, I want to talk about model-based reinforcement learning for data-efficient decision-making. Then I want to talk about model-predictive uh, model reinforcement learning to speed up learning even further by online planning. And uh, the last pillar I want to talk about is meta-learning to generalize knowledge to new situations. So let's get started with um, model-based reinforcement learning. <clears throat> and roughly speaking, uh, this is the setting that we are going to talk about. We have um, a state uh, of the system at time step t plus 1, which is a function of the state at time step t and a control signal at time step t, and there may be some um, additive uh, noise. <clears throat> the control signal itself is a function of the state and some parameters. So these parameters are po called policy parameters, and the function pi is called a policy. <laughs> um, so the objective now in reinforcement learning is to find optimal policy parameters theta star that minimize some expected long-term cost. So J of theta. J of theta is a sum, finite horizon sum of expected costs at each time step. So this cost function could be like a squared penalty between the current position of the robot and the target position of the robot. Like a, for example a squared distance here. And I'm also going to assume that the initial state is Gaussian distributed. So this kind of objective is a typical objective in uh, reinforcement learning and in optimal control. And roughly speaking, the difference between reinforcement learning and optimal control is that in optimal control, we make the assumption that we know what the state transition function is, whereas in reinforcement learning, we don't. And if we want to talk about um, autonomous learning, then we are much more in the reinforcement learning setting where we have no particular knowledge about the transition function. Autonomous learning ideally tries to take humans out of the loop as much as possible. So I'm going to focus on this reinforcement learning setting. And in the context of model-based reinforcement learning, I want to introduce a conceptually very simple algorithm for uh, relatively rapid learning. And this algorithm consists only of four steps. <coughs> so the first thing this algorithm does is it learns this function that we do not know. So it learns a probabilistic model 
for the transition function, and I will motivate why the probabilistic model is really critical. Once this probabilistic model is learned, we can use now this model to simulate what would actually be happening in the real world. And so we use this to compute long-term predictions of the state evolution for a given controller parameterization. Then we improve the policy by tweaking these controller parameters in order to minimize this cost function that, we, uh, that, that, that is our objective, to minimize this cost function. And once we have that controller, we go back and apply the controller to the system. So conceptually, this algorithm is actually very simple. Learn the model, long-term predictions, optimize the controller parameters, apply, this, uh, apply the controller. And I want to go very briefly through all of these four steps. So let's start with this learning of this transition function. So here's kind of like a setting that we consider. Learning a transition function is uh, effectively solving a regression problem. And now assume we have a regression problem where we have uh, inputs x and observations y, and for the sake of illustration, assume these observations are noise-free. <coughs> so this means that uh, for solving this regression problem, we need to find a function that connects all of these uh, observations. And here's a plausible model that solves our problem. So now the interesting part, and, but also the challenging part in reinforcement learning is that we're not really done with modeling. Right? So we want to use this model for something. We want to make predictions, and based on these predictions, we want to make decisions. So if I query this model now over here at x equals 7, the model will predict some value that is around minus 1. Okay, so we can take this value, and now we can make a decision. The problem is that, you know, if we have a robot that is driving along the cliff, and this um, decision is to turn left, that may be good or may not be good. Uh, the problem is that there isn't really that much evidence that this is the right function uh, to fit. So we can solve this regression problem in many other ways, and here are two other ways. So they all connect these dots, these, uh, these three functions, but they would give me completely different predictions and therefore potentially also different uh, decisions. And this kind of like the problem of model errors is very significant in the context of model-based reinforcement learning. <coughs> so instead of like fitting a function um, to solve this particular problem, we're going to place a probability distribution over plausible functions. And uh, so this is now a posterior probability distribution over plausible functions. And if I now make a prediction at x equals 7, what this model will now tell me is that my predicted value is uh, 0, but actually I have no idea what's going on. So, and that is uh, expressed by the size of these error bars. <coughs> If we take this knowledge or the lack of knowledge into account when making decisions, then we are much more robust to model errors. So what I want to say here is that we need to really express uncertainty about the underlying function to be robust or more robust to these modeling errors. And I will use a Gaussian process for exactly this particular uh, purpose. So I will use a Gaussian process to implement this distribution over plausible transition functions. So now that we use this Gaussian process uh, or have this Gaussian process for learning this transition function, we're going to use it for making long-term predictions. <coughs> and here's kind of like the idea. We start off with this initial state distribution at time step zero. And the idea is to push this uh, over time or propagate it over time and get a distribution at each time step about what the state is going to look like. So we're going to iteratively compute the evolution of the state. And if we take one time slice out, I just want to highlight kind of like the problem that we need to solve. Um, so we have a distribution uh, at time step t, and we have a Gaussian process model that takes us from time step t to time step t plus 1. So that's the transition function. So in order to um, get the predictive distribution, we have to solve um, triple integral. So where we have to integrate everything out that is uncertain. So we have here we have a distribution on the state and the control signal. So we, have, uh, we integrate out state and control. But we also need to integrate out uh, with respect to the distribution over the plausible function. So we have to uh, take the uncertainty of the Gaussian process into account. <coughs> 
So if we solve this triple integral, we get this predictive distribution, which is this shaded um, uh, area over here. The problem is uh, we cannot solve this, uh, this integral in closed form because of various nonlinearities. But one of the things we can do is we can compute the mean and the variance of this distribution in closed form and then approximate this shaded distribution with, a, with this blue distribution, with this blue Gaussian distribution. So now we can take this blue Gaussian distribution at time step t plus 1 and push it through the Gaussian process again and kind of like cycle through iteratively. So that is an, uh, is an approximation, but um, it's a deterministic approximation. That means we can write down an equation that solves our problem. So, and this allows us to propagate the state over time and compute this um, evolution of the state for a given controller parameterization. <coughs> so if we now come to the to the next point, which is like improving the policy. Uh, roughly speaking, it uh, consists of two steps. So computing the expected long-term cost and then finding the parameters that minimize this cost. So in order to compute this long-term cost, um, so the long-term long -term cost here is the sum of expected costs at each time step. And we already have these kind of like predictive distributions which are approximated by Gaussians. So at each time step, we only have to solve one particular integral, so the uh, integral of the cost functions times the Gaussian distribution at each time step. And if we choose the cost function in a convenient way, then we can solve this integral in closed form. So cost functions that allow us to solve this include polynomials or radial basis function networks uh, or um, even like Fourier series and so on and so forth. And once we have that, then we can sum them up and we get an, uh, a number for this expected cost. So one of the things that is actually quite nice up to this point is that we can, so we can compute an approximation to this cost in closed form. That means we can write down a rather lengthy equation that gives us exactly this number. But that also allows us to compute gradients of the costs with respect to the policy parameters and that allows us then to also use some standard gradient-based optimizers such as BFGS um, or whatever your favorite method is to find these optimal policy parameters. So the last point is now, <coughs> now that we have improved the policy, is now that we, we can now apply the controller. So we apply this controller now to the real system, we collect more data, and then we go through, uh, through these four steps again. So with more data, we can update our model, we can replan, we can re-optimize the policy and apply the policy again. And for applying the controller, I thought I'm going to show you a quick video of uh, how this actually works. So um, we initially looked at a standard benchmark problem, which is a, a card pole swing up. You, some of you probably have seen this before. So there's a cart which is running on a track with a pendulum attached to it, so the pendulum is freely swinging. And the idea is to push the cart to the left and to the right to swing the pendulum up and balance it in the middle of the track, so where the, where the red cross is. Um, so we do not make any assumption about the nonlinear dynamics. Um, we really want to learn from scratch. It means we really want to learn only from the collected data that we have. And we use a cost function, which is um, some sort of like saturating cost function that penalizes the distance, the Euclidean distance between the tip of the pendulum and the, and the red cross. So there are no penalties on controls or velocities. It's really just a Euclidean distance. <coughs> and let me see how that works. Yes. So this is how it works. So initially, we... Uh, we apply random actions to the system, so it's like moving around um, in some random, random way. So each of these trials is two and a half seconds long. So now we have uh, five seconds of data, and we learn this Gaussian process model, we predict into the future, we optimize the parameters, and now reapply the learned controller to the system. Okay, so the only thing that it learned is to keep the cart in the middle of the track. But if you, look, if you look at the predictive uncertainties, they explode after two or three steps. But it has now data in this regime, and it knows that it didn't do well, so it needs to change the strategy. And the strategy that it uh, uh, changes, uh, changes to now is a kind of like this idea of getting this swing-up movement. 
It's a bit overexcited, um, but again, it's, it collects data in areas of the state space that it has not seen before. And that the Gaussian process model will account for this and it will then drive the learning process in a way that it automatically learns to slow down the swing up movement. And you can see in every iteration of this learning um, a significant improvement compared to the previous trial. So it's really one of the very few reinforcement learning algorithms where you can see this instead of like waiting for thousands of more trials. <clears throat> so now after 15 seconds it kind of like solves the problem and now I'm going to run this for a little bit longer and keep in mind we only penalize the distance between the tip of the pendulum and the laser pointer uh, and you can even annoy it a little bit so it accounts for, uh, for small disturbances that it has not seen before. So that's kind of like the idea of how this works. Um, so this was, uh, given that this is a standard benchmark problem uh, there's lots of work uh, in the literature um, with respect to this problem. What I'm drawing here is like a little chart with like references <coughs> and uh, the required experimentation time in seconds. So I mean all of these ones are in simulation but I mean that it doesn't really matter. Um, the settings are similar. So this line over here is a one day of data collection. This is an hour of data collection and this is a minute of data collection. And compared to, uh, to this, we are uh, an order of magnitude faster and achieve an unprecedented learning speed compared to the state of the art, um, at least at the time when we were uh, doing that research. So this was, um, I think, this was very exciting at this time and we then tried to apply this to a bunch of other problems and uh, because this now allows us to solve more complicated problems. For example, so this was a visual navigation problem with a really cheap robot arm uh, for, for uh, block stacking. So there was a camera was tracking a block in the, in the gripper of the, um, of the robot arm uh, and the robot learned automatically to stack this tower of blocks. This one was a problem with um, a tendon driven robot arm for like hitting table tennis balls. This one is another robot arm for playing curling. This one is some work uh, by Bosch on a hierarchical navigation problem. And this one is work uh, from uh, or by Andrew McCutcheon in Cambridge where he used this algorithm for balancing a unicycle in uh, at least the, the pitch, so one direction. The reason why, so in simulation it works fine with controlling the full unicycle but this is a 30 kilogram unicycle, so you don't want to have that driving around and running into walls. Definitely not in the UK with these high quality walls. So <laughs> they have going to have uh, holes in the buildings. Um, so that was the reason why it's only pitch control. So that's kind of like the idea behind this, uh, this piece of work. <coughs> so the point I really wanted to make is that uh, in robotics, data efficient learning is very important. And I introduced a probabilistic model-based reinforcement learning approach which allows us to reduce model bias, achieves an unprecedented learning speed and it can be widely or is widely applicable to a, to a, a range of uh, diff uh, different uh, robotic systems. So I want to now come to the second pillar of, um, of this uh, idea of like data efficient reinforcement learning we want to look at model predictive control or model predictive reinforcement learning. <coughs> and the, re the reason for this is that we want to use these ideas for safe exploration. Um, so in, when we work with robots, we often have uh, real world safety constraints. I mean, you've seen some robot arms earlier. Uh, you do not want to have these robots, uh, robot arms hitting the, the table, for example, or the drones to crash. So there's some things that you really would like to avoid. And so the idea is really to use these probabilistic models now to predict whether constraints are violated and adjust the policy if necessary. So that's really the high level idea. Um, so we're going to propose uh, a method for safe exploration within a model predictive control uh, reinforcement learning setting. 
Uh, here the idea is to, so when, we, when I said earlier, we optimize policy parameters. So these policy parameters can be quite high dimensional. So like thousands, ten thousands of parameters we can optimize. Think of a neural network, so then you know how many parameters you can optimize. But you can also optimize the control signals directly, so that gives you a much lower dimensional optimization problem. So treat the control parameters as free parameters. So <coughs> if we optimize these control parameters directly instead of the policy parameters, we have a much lower dimensional search space. But the problem we have now is that we have an open loop control problem. That means uh, we cannot react to changes in the state. So the other policy we optimized earlier was a function of the state, but this one is no longer a function of the state. So open loop means is I'm going to provide the system, let's say, 20 control signals, and whatever happens, I will apply these control signals. So there's not, no change independent, uh, independent of what, uh, what, this, what the robot does. So and if we have minor model inaccuracies, there's no way we can succeed with this strategy. But there's a way to fix this. Uh, using model predictive control, and that turns this into a closed-loop control approach. And I'm going to explain this in a, uh, on the next slide how this happens. The positive side effect with this approach is that we can increase the robustness of the, uh, to model errors because it's an online planning approach, and if we are more robust to model errors, we can also learn faster. So it's another way to speeding up things. And here's kind of like the idea of how this works. So we learn again this Gaussian process model for the system dynamics in exactly the same way that we did it before. And then if we are in a current state xt, we are planning a, uh, an op uh, or determine the optimal control sequence from this particular state, which consists of, let's say, h uh, con uh, control signals, but we only apply the first one. So the first control signal in this current state takes me over here. And then I update the Gaussian process with the transition that I just observed, and then I replan. So I compute again these H control signals and apply only the first control signal that brings me over here. I update the Gaussian process with the observed transition, and I replan. So every time step, I need to compute these, uh, these uh, control signals. So that needs to be relatively fast. So typically, the, uh, this, is, uh, this H is not, not super huge, so maybe 10, 15 time steps. <coughs> so now, we also have some theoretical results here. So the, I mentioned earlier this kind of like this moment matching idea where we approximate this nasty, uh, nasty distribution with a Gaussian distribution, and I said we can do this in closed form. So that allows us to propagate uncertainty in a deterministic way over time. Um, and that also allows us to reformulate the system dynamics. If we define um, a state Z to be the mean and the covariance matrix of a particular state, what moment matching actually only does is it takes us from one set of moments at one, con uh, at one time step to a set of moments at the next time step if we um, supply one control signal over here. So we can just talk about system dynamics in the sense of moment matching. So that turns this entire um, system into uh, a deterministic system that propagates moments. And we can prove uh, Lipschitz continuity under relatively mild assumptions. And that allows us to apply some uh, uh, some theory from uh, control theory called uh, uh, Pontryagin's minimum principle, which allows us to uh, have a principled treatment of control constraints. So that's one of the constraints that we want to deal with is control constraints, and the other one is state constraints. So control constraints we're going to hit with this. That's okay, but the state constraints we haven't dealt with yet. But the state constraints we can deal with by looking at our predictive uncertainty and check whether state co the state constraints are violated with high probability. So that requires us to have some reasonable error bars on our predictions. So <coughs> if we now run this on, again, this, this card poll system, let's say in, in simulation here, 
I want to do, uh, I want to look at two things. So one is the learning speed in an unconstrained setting and one at, uh, at a constrained setting. Let's start with the, with the learning speed. So one of, we have uh, three methods here. So the, the red one is the method I, uh, I introduced earlier, the first part of the talk. And you can see, so if each trial here is three seconds long, uh, we get to about 90% uh, success rate after five trials, about 15 seconds. That's kind of like also what we had earlier in the, in the video. Um, then we have this thing called a zero var. So instead of using the full Gaussian process, we're going to ditch the uncertainty of the Gaussian process and just going to run with a deterministic system. Um, with model predictive control, this actually works. In the other setting, it does not work. There's uh, no chance of success you can get this working with the, with the red algorithm. But model predictive control actually makes this work. <coughs> um, and then there's this uh, MPC uh, with Gaussian process. So you basically take the uncertainty into account and do the predictions as well. So it ballpark learns at the same speed uh, as, the, as the zero variance uh, method. But both of them are significantly faster if you look at like how long does it take to hit the 90% uh, success rate they are much faster than the red method, so they kind of like shave off about 40% of experimentation time. If we go to a more complicated system, so like a double pendulum system instead of this uh, card pole system, the yellow method, so the zero var, completely fails. So, and the, the blue method, which is the um, MPC method where you predict with the variances, will again take 40% of uh, the learning or experimentation time from the, uh, from the red method. So that's a relatively consistent pattern we observe. But one of the interesting things here is really that MPC is much more robust to model inaccuracies than a parameterized feedback controller. And the reason why this is the case is um, that we can update the Gaussian process model after every time step and not after every episode that we, uh, that we run. So that's the key point here. So now we can run this with constraints, again, like with the, the system, that the, the card pole system, but now we're going to build a wall on one side. So you would like to avoid this wall um, if possible. <coughs> uh, so, and again, these are kind of like the same kind of learning rates that we had earlier. And uh, effectively what we see is that learning with uh, predicting uncertainty forward and checking whether two times the predictive standard deviation uh, violates this constraint uh, will lead to pretty fast learning. Uh, if we only look at whether the mean violates or the mean prediction violates our constraint, then the learning is a bit slower or significantly slower. And if we don't care about constraints at all, um, it's, it's really slow. But also like the, the constraint violation, so we ran 100 experiments so that if we predict with the variances and check whether, you know, whether our constraints are violated or not violated with high probability, we get like a 3% error rate, which falls into kind of like the ballpark that we were expecting, whereas the other methods are at like between like 15 and 20%. So that's, so the key thing here is really that propagating model uncertainty is important, to, uh, is important for, uh, for safety. To summarize this, uh, this part is, so I really want to make a point that probabilistic prediction models can be used for safe exploration, and uncertainty propagation can be used to reduce violation of safety constraints. And additionally, this model predictive control framework increases the robustness to model errors and leads to faster learning or an increased data efficiency in reinforcement learning. So the last part I would like to talk about is meta-learning. Um, so maybe meta-learning we can think of a, as a general framework for transfer learning. And the idea is really to generalize knowledge from known tasks to new or related tasks. And imagine we have uh, four different robots uh, given. They all have the same link. 
uh, or the same kind of like uh, links, a number of links, but the the weight of the links may change or the length of the links may uh, may change. And if we want to learn predictive models and controllers for all of these robot arms, we can learn all of them from scratch um, independently, so that's absolutely fine. But there must be some way to transfer knowledge from this robot arm to that robot arm, because they kind of like look like the same, they shouldn't be behaving too different from each other. And that's exactly where meta-learning comes in. The um, idea is really to um, reuse experience uh, that we have collected so far to generalize learning to new, situa uh, to new situations and thereby also accelerate learning. So it's a different way to speed up learning. And <coughs> the approach we take is to separate uh, global and task-specific properties. For example, in this setting here, the global dynamics of the arm should be are probably shared across these robots, but there are some robot-specific uh, things that change the dynamics, like the weight of the, of the robot arm, for example. So the shared global parameter is here described, the general dynamics, and we describe the task-specific local configurations using a latent variable. We then use online variational inference um, to infer unseen configurations of these robot arms, and that will also allow for few-shot model-based reinforcement learning. And here's kind of like the idea of how this works. <clears throat> I'm drawing a graphical model over here. So the, really the, the dynamics I'm going to look at here is y is a function of x, um, let's say, oh, and u, so u is a control signal again. But now we have this additional um, variable h in here. So previously this h parameter was not sitting here, we just were looking at um, a uh, function of the state and a control signal. So the Gaussian process, so this f function, uh, in this graphical model over here, captures the global properties of the dynamics and the latent variable h, this additional thing here, describes the local configuration. Um, so we can use variational inference to find a posterior distribution on the latent configuration. But let's have a look at what this, what this could look like in a, in a simplified setting. So we have a, a bunch of functions here. Um, so six different functions. And the only difference between these functions is a vertical offset. They're copies of each other, but there's a vertical offset. So the function itself is, this, is now modeled with this Gaussian process, and h is, a, is this offset parameter that we need to learn. We give the model training data, these um, black dots, from two of those functions, <coughs> and uh, then we query with one new additional point, um, let's say this one over here. With this point, we can infer what the latent variable, therefore the offset is, and once we have the offset, we can generalize without any additional data, um, just from like uh, having seen these, these snippets of data from these two different functions. So with one data point, this one here, one, this one here, this one here, and this one here, so one data point per function, we can get a very good generalization of the function because the global properties of this function are shared and the only thing we need to infer is the offset. And that can work pretty quickly. Yeah, so, and there's no model retraining required to get these kind of like um, um, function distributions. So the blue, the blue is the, uh, the training model, or tr the training predictions, and the orange one are one-shot learning, or actually zero-shot learning, test predictions. So now we can uh, also put this into the context of reinforcement learning. Again, we're going to go back to this card pole system, which I'm using here as a running example. <coughs> and we are going to modify the card pole, or the pole, um, 
by changing the length and by changing masses. Yeah, so we make it heavier or lighter or longer and shorter. So we have six different tasks which we use for training. So similar to these two functions here, we have six different tasks, which are these, uh, these disks here, these three orange and the three green disks. And then we are going to run um, different configurations, which means we're gonna just going to use um, trajectory data observed from different configurations and find latent embeddings or latent representations based on these configurations. And what we find is a latent representation of, uh, of a grid. Uh, so th they are living on a grid, uh, except this one thing here, there's a um, 0.2 difference. That's the reason why there's a bigger gap over here. Um, but we find an embedding that makes sense. We find an embedding where we can approximately draw axis, uh, so shorter length is, uh, is up here and longer goes down this axis, and light uh, pendulum is uh, up here and I can make it heavier. So this is ordered according these two, uh, to, to these two axes. And what the embedding finds is that long and heavy pendulums give rise to very similar dynamics because they don't move that much anymore. So we can cluster this relatively nicely. Uh, and if you go to short and light, then the dynamics are very difficult to predict. So this, this one here is now very dissimilar from all other tasks that we, uh, that we have uh, in this embedding here. So this is, um, so the embedding makes, uh, makes sense. And now we can use this also for uh, reinforcement learning. Again, if we look at just looking at how long does it take to train these six test, uh, sorry, these six training tasks, um, <coughs> we're going to use this um, Gaussian process MPC method that I introduced in the second part uh, of this talk, and we need about 16.1 uh, seconds to train these uh, six different. <coughs> Uh, six different training tasks. Um, so that's independent. There's no way that we can transfer knowledge. Uh, we can also aggregate the experience, just like put all the trajectory data together and pretend it comes from one global system. We can still learn this. Uh, that was a bit surprising. It takes a bit longer. But if we add these latent variables where we share um, the global dynamics but make a distinction between local uh, differences, we can learn a bit faster. So it's not that much faster than just learning independently, but it helps speeding up reinforcement learning. But now the trick comes when we actually look at not only the training task, but also a test task that we have not seen. And then we have like learning curves that look like this. So we have this um, uh, meta learning with Gaussian processes, the um, kind of like idea that I introduced uh, a few minutes ago is this blue curve here. We have, these, we have these six training tasks that it already learned and we have an additional four test tasks that we want to um, test it on and we do not want to forget the training tasks. So success means it needs to succeed in all, solving all ten, uh, ten tasks. And let's say if we want to look at an 80% success rate then it requires an additional three trials to get to this. Um, so the, the transfer is pretty, uh, is very good. If we look at the uh, independent models, we just learn these you know, additional four tasks um, on top, then we get to, well, we require another six, um, six trials to get to this point. Uh, but if we aggregate, then learning kind of like stagnates because the assumption that one global model can be used to explain all these different tasks will eventually fail if the dynamics are sufficiently dissimilar. So we're not going to get to the 80% uh, success rate by just aggregating data. So to summarize this part, um, so we want to generalize knowledge from known situation to unseen ones to facilita facilitate few-shot learning. 
We propose to use a latent variable model to describe how related the tasks are and we achieve a significant speed up in model learning and model based reinforcement learning compared to various other baselines that we used. So to wrap this entire talk up is I really wanted, so I wanted to make a point that data efficiency is a practical challenge that we need to address in autonomous robots and I talked about three pillars of data efficient reinforcement learning. So one was probabilistic model based reinforcement learning for fast learning of models and controllers. The second one was model predictive control with learned dynamics models to accelerate learning and allow for safe exploration. And the third one was meta-learning that allows us to use latent variables to generalize knowledge to new situations. But under the hood, really the key to success is probabilistic modeling and Bayesian inference. Thank you uh, for your attention. So oh, thank you. So now we we have time for questions. There is one question here. <coughs> uh, so my question would be that it all looks amazing uh, and very interesting. Thank you for the great talk. But what would you say are the limitations of probabilistic modeling in this <coughs> context? Okay. So question. Yeah. Question about limitations of probabilistic modeling. Um, I think a typical answer is there's always some sacrif uh, sacrifice in terms of compute. I mean, it's not cheap to, to do these computations. Um, there's also the thing that we cannot do exact probabilistic inference, so we have to make approximations somewhere, so that also comes at some cost. Um, so I would say these are the two, the two things that, um, yeah, that you would probably expect. <coughs> yes, um, and in terms of the kind of tasks that you could solve, so I imagine like normally with what we saw here today were the control tasks, and what if it would be something else like, I don't know, navigation? Uh, so so uh, navigation was one of the examples that, well, let's say other people did, that was this, uh, this one picture I had, um, here, so people at Bosch use this idea for navigating a robot through this kind of like maze. So a navigation problem is effectively also a control problem, you just, if you want to think about it this way. But so one of the things that's very difficult here is, so by, by using these Gaussian processes, we make smoothness assumptions. So everything that comes with like non-smooth dynamics where we have contact, you know, things become a bit more complicated. And then uh, this, in this, let's say, vanilla form, this entire system will not succeed. What you can then do is you could use other ideas, like for example, um, Bayesian optimization uh, to, to solve those problems. Um, or you can use hierarchical models that account for uh, discontinuities because normally you have your discontinuities along like a manifold and if you, if you go away from this point of discontinuity, functions are relatively smooth, often. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> yeah. So uh, thank you for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, my question is related to uh, more traditional theory in control, uh, in which, of course, you know, as he was saying, it was very clear, and uh, I really appreciated the fact that the main difference is that in general control, you assume that you know the state process, and here you don't. Uh, so, but let's say that you you would like to eventually study, um, uh, you know, stability for some well-known uh, scenarios for which you may have not to design your system, but to the analysis, you may have this state process. Uh, have you tried to study uh, any type of confidence bounds in terms of stability or something like that for well-known, some typical toys examples uh, from a theoretical perspective? Um, we have started looking into this, um, so more robustness, not, not stability. Um, 
there are a couple of problems that come with this. So one is the nonlinearity of the model. So I think even in, in classical control theory, as soon as nonlinearities appear, uh, things become a bit more complicated. And then on top of the nonlinearity, you have the probability distributions. So that makes it a bit more, even more complicated. So we started looking into, uh, into robustness um, ideas. Um, but we, we don't have any results yet. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, so I have, to, I have two questions. The first question is uh, I'd be interesting that you elaborate on the um, computational cost, especially like uh, I'd be interesting to see w what's your perspective on um, how to scale this approach to high dimensional perceptual and action spaces. Where, 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 for example, the action space could have uh, several dozens of dimensions. So that's the, fir the first question. And the second question is, um, in the model predictive uh, control approach, uh, when you sample the sequences of action, uh, um, uh, how, do you, how do you see handling problems where the, the cost is uh, not dense but very sparse? Which means that the probability when you sample uh, your uh, your sequence of action in uh, at, the, at this step of uh, actually uh, finding an, a non-zero reward or uh, cost is is very very low. So how what's your perspective on uh, approaching that? Okay, so let me try to remember this. Uh, I may need to ask again. So first question was about scalability in terms of state and action dimensions. So. Um, we have run this particular uh, method on 20-dimensional states. Um, in terms of action spaces, we only looked at maybe, let's say, five, five dimensions, but continuous actions. So we're always looking at continuous uh, actions and state spaces here. So <coughs> um, if we want to go much higher in the state dimensionality, we have to do some sort of like representation learning. There's, for example, um, learning directly from pixels, there's no way we can do this. Um, but we are working on probabilistic models for representation le learning, and hopefully in the next maybe two or three years, we're gonna get somewhere. So there's something that we need to do on top of this. Um, in terms of uh, action spaces, um, yeah, I, I, w I would say the same kind of like limitations will apply. I, in the, so in the first part, we optimize these controller parameters. So the action dimension is not so critical. It's more the dimensionality of the parameter space that we optimize in that sense. Um, and we have optimized uh, a few thousand of controller parameters. So it's a relatively high dimensional optimization problem. In the model predictive control part, then the action dimensionality is a bit more critical and that will, because that makes the, the real time uh, optimization problem significantly harder. Whereas in the first part, there is no real time optimization necessary. Now, the second question was, can you repeat that? It was in the model predictive control part where um, you, you need to sample sequences of actions um, uh, and then you evaluate them. Sparse rewards. <coughs> yes. Okay, so, but is your question specific to model predictive control or in general? No, no, it's, it's specific to how to handle uh, sparse rewards in model predictive control. Okay, so the thing that we have is the rewards that we that we choose are normally not particularly rich. Um, so one of the things that we do is we compute these expected costs, right? So it's an expect or expected reward. And that's the integral of the cost. Assume it's a delta spike in a continuous space, but then times a Gaussian distribution. As soon as the Gaussian distribution starts having some overlap with your delta spike, you will have a gradient signal. And that is, uh, so that is true for the MPC part, but it's also true for the first part. And I have played around with the width of the cost function. So the cost function I choose here is, um, so one minus a Gaussian shape thing, right? So it's uh, something that plateaus, and then it goes like a Gaussian shape and it plateaus. And so you can now choose the width of this Gaussian. If you make this width relatively small, 
you effectively have a delta spike as a, as a reward function. So I've played around with this, and I made this reward extremely spiky, and it can still learn. So that, and the, and the reason for this is again like the uncertainty propagation, because that gives you um, probability mass in the spiky reward area. Yes, yeah. So one last question here. Um, I've got a question about um, the, uh, the MPC uh, part uh, regarding the safety constraints, the violations of, of the safety constraints. Um, if you were to offer a guarantee that the constraints are not violated in, say, 99% uh, of the time or anything that looks like a target um, to match, uh, what would be the, um, the, the variables that you would act on to, uh, to put this uh, guarantee? Uh, like number of <coughs> training samples, I don't know, trials? Uh. So currently we use the predictive uncertainty, uh, so all Gaussian approximated, as an estimate of the probability of violating the constraint. <coughs> so if you want to use this, then we need to be relatively confident that the error bars are not too small. Um, so they may be a bit too big, but that would be in our favor if you want to make some guarantees. Um, our experience is that the error bars are normally not too small. Uh, because we, so using this moment matching idea, we um, implicitly minimize the KL divergence in the right way. And so um, we minimize the KL divergence between the true distribution and the approximate distribution, which gives you this really con relatively conservative uh, approximation. So if you were to do it the other way around, then, you know, then things would be a bit more complicated. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we can thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.